OK, good morning. Uh, let's get started. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, please. Are you free? <laughs> yes, I am. Okay. Any technical questions? <laughs> or any other administrative questions? OK, so let me uh, now move to materials. So, so far, we have talked about electric fields in vacuum. So if you remember all our formulas, you have that epsilon naught in there, in the field expressions. And epsilon naught means that we are considering everything in vacuum. So obviously, we need to uh, consider as well uh, other materials than vacuum. And we'll start today from conductors. Before I get to conductors, let me just point out that we characterize materials based on the freedom of charges to move. What charges typically electrons to move? So we have perfect dielectrics, which we commonly call insulators or perfect insulators, where all charges are bound. Practically, what we mean by that is that electrons are bound to their nuclei. And therefore, under the influence of an electric field, they cannot move. Uh, they, they, uh, experience a force by the electric field, but there is a stronger force by the nucleus, so they stay bound. So that is what we call perfect dielectric or perfect insulator. And then we can be somewhere in between where most charges are bound, but some are free. And these are the dielectrics or the imperfect dielectrics or lossy dielectrics, uh, most uh, dielectric materials that we encounter, just like this one that uh, you buy of uh, the shelf FR4 to print uh, printed circuit boards. And uh, then when you move up in this electron mobility chart, uh, you have conductors where most now are free. Most charges are free to move, but some may be bound. And then the perfect conductors where we just consider this is uh, the limit where all charges can be considered free. So. The range where we have currents is actually this range. And remember, currents are charges in motion. And therefore, we do not have them in perfect dielectrics. That's why these are uh, the insulating materials. And um, I'd like to point out here that insulator does not mean that the electric field is zero in there. Uh, in fact, as you will see, it is exactly the opposite. Insulator means that there is no current. The electric field is there, but it cannot move electrons because the electrons are just strongly bound to their nucleus, so therefore they cannot move. So these are the insulators here that we are not really having any currents. We need to uh, study them separately, but if we are interested, and as I will be interested today to study currents, then we are looking uh, on this side of the, of the chart. And uh, I start with, uh, I pick one material, a semiconductor. So in semiconductors, like germanium, for example, an electric field, so let's say that we take a capacitor, the capacitor that we uh, studied uh, with Gauss's law and with uh, the, the Laplace equation. So I take this capacitor here, the two plates, and I let them establish an electric field like this. So this is the positive plate, this is the negative plate. And I stick in now, instead of uh, considering this capacitor in vacuum, I stick in a a slab of germanium in here. <coughs> okay, so this is uh, germanium. So in semiconductors, you have electrons that are moving, and we have, as we say, holes, and holes are basically um, absence of electrons. However, we model them, as you may have discussed in your circuits courses, as positive charges. So in principle, when I have this electric field, that electric field will interact with electrons and with 
holes, which I model as absent as uh, positive charges. Uh, so the electric field, obviously, on the electron, it will exercise a force that uh, goes against the field. Remember, the Coulomb force is Q times electric field. So if the uh, if the uh, charge is negative, then the uh, force is opposite to the field, and on the holes, the the force will be like this. So now the force will, uh, will actually make these uh, charges move and uh, and hence will produce currents. And I want to find and characterize how much current I have there. And that is uh, uh, my next goal. To get there, I introduce the notion of the electron of the, ch of the particle mobility. As follows. Um, so because of this uh, force, there will be a velocity. So this velocity will be proportional to the electric field, and the proportionality constant is what we call the mobility. So depending on the weight, depending on the place of the charge, uh, and overall the crystal, there will be a different mobility of these particles. So for example, the electrons will have so velocity of the electrons, minus electron mobility times the electric field. So we know that the velocity will be opposite to the field and that proportionality, that constant, that will give you the ratio between the velocity and the field strength is what we call the electron mobility. And likewise, we will have a mobility for the holes. So instead of uh, solving equations of motion here and doing Newton's law and so on, we introduce this concept of mobility that tells us, gives us a measure as to how well do the charges respond to an external electric field. And that will be now new age E. So you see there is no minus sign there because they are moving in the, the holes are moving in the direction of the field. And just to give you an idea, first of all, uh, the units of mobility, you can find them from here. So velocity is given in meters per second the electric field in volts per meter. So therefore, the units will be uh, meter squared by volts seconds. And just to give you an idea of uh, the values of uh, mobility, so for copper, copper, in fact, belongs to this end of this chart. So it's actually a good conductor. And uh, the main charged particles that are moving in copper are electrons. So when, when I'm talking about mobility in copper, I talk about basically mobility of electrons. And that mobility of electrons in copper is 0 0.0032 meters squared by volt second. So this looks like a small number. However, if you want to evaluate it, if you take a an electric field of uh, point zero 0.02 volts per meter, so a relatively uh, small as well electric field, 
then the velocity of the electrons, and I'm talking about absolute values here and not direction, I uh, just want to give you a sense of the magnitude of those velocities that we will see, will be 0 0.0032 times 0 0.02, which will be uh, 6.4 times 10 to minus 5 meters per second. So obviously this is, these are not Formula One uh, speeds, however, for a crystal they are humongous speeds. Uh, so this is uh, something like 64 microns per second. So you calculate how many angstroms per second. So this is actually a very high speed for the crystal of a material and, and it shows really that indeed copper is a good conductor. So now, uh, any questions up to this point? Uh, yes, please. Could you re-explain why you call it holes? Is there a reason why for the positive charge? So uh, in a semiconductor, the holes are not actually positive charges. They are absences in the crystal of electrons that we are modeling as positive charges. So in the theory of semiconductors, uh, these are effectively treated as positive charges. I think she had the question before, sorry. Yes, please. That's right, but because of uh, the motion of the electrons to the left, we see these absences in the crystal that are also moving to the right. So in uh, the analysis of semiconductors, uh, we effectively treat those holes as charges that are moving to the other side. I think he was first. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so here the new age, what does that represent? Does the that mobility of holes. Oh, so is that a relative term or like? She was asking because holes are technically not moving, but the yes, but we observe a velocity that this uh, hole is actually propagating to the right, so that velocity can be assigned also a mobility. Uh, just a follow up question: Isn't that like a just a relative term of how the elect one electron is just filling up the hole and the another one is getting? Yes, but the correspondence not ex is not exactly one to one, and again, this is more for a semiconductor theory course to explain because. Uh, there are forces and inertia of the particles inside the, uh, inside the crystal. So therefore, it's not necessary that when you see uh, electrons moving to the left with velocity x meters per second, there will be holes with minus x meters per second to the right. So there, is, uh, uh, there are forces in the crystal that control uh, the relative uh, mobilities of the charges. Uh, yes, please. No, no, it's not necessarily equal in magnitude. That's right. And uh, neither the populations are uh, equal in magnitude. So I just want to get to the point where I will be able to define a current that we can use more macroscopically. Because you see here we're talking about particles. And the real revolution, I mean, electrical engineering really started when people were able to see those microscopic effects macroscopically so that they can engineer them. If you think about voltage, for example, voltage is something that we can measure. It is caused by motions of particles and small things inside crystals. However, we're able to define a macroscopic quantity that then we can measure. And that's where you start doing engineering. Compare this to, for example, uh, medicine, right, that knows he has no laws, no, knows nothing, and the only thing that they can do is actually go patient by patient and measure and observe, 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 uh, uh, almost uh, being in the state that electrical engineering was before Ohm's law. Now, I will derive Ohm's law from first principles in a bit. You know what is Ohm's law in a resistor voltage is resistance times current. This is a very simple law now that we see it macroscopically, but microscopically, it is caused by all these motions, right? Imagine if instead of Ohm's law, we, ha we were looking at particle by particle to see what is going on inside the material when it interacts with the electric field. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. Uh, we wouldn't be talking about electrical engineering right now. So uh, this is the mobility for copper. And now I want to really study currents. And uh, so to study currents, 
uh, that this rate of change of charge inside uh, this slab due to the motion of the particles let me start let me define first of all n sub h which is number of holes per unit volume and uh, n sub e number of electrons per unit volume okay so that means basically that in a volume dv I have uh, dQ of electrons, n sub e times or minus n sub e, e dV. Okay, so that is, uh, this is number. So if I want to find charge, I multiply the number times the charge, which is minus e, the 1.6. Remember, e is 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 Coulomb. Uh, times the volume, so that is the relation, and uh, likewise dQH will be plus an H E dV. Okay, so this is uh, the, how I use this number of uh, holes or electrons per unit volume. So now on to currents. If I go back here and I define a small area through which these charges are flowing let me assign to this a ds so this ds is very similar to this differential um, surface elements that we have been using in Gauss's law so through that ds there is holes that go into the right electrons that go into the left if you think about it they are both currents that flowing in the same direction because as the Holes are going this way, they make this more positive. As the electrons are leaving this way, they also make this side more positive. So we have uh, basically currents that essentially, although I have uh, drawn them in opposite directions, because the one is a positive charge, the other there is a negative charge, essentially they are currents that are co-directional and they reinforce each other. So let me take one by one for the holes to begin with. Uh, if I observe this uh, area ds over time dt and why do I do this because current is rate of change of charge so therefore I need to basically measure how much charge goes through this area and find and divide that dq over dt then I will have a current so that's how current is uh, fundamentally defined so I have here this d sub s right so now uh, these holes are moving to the right and over time dt if they have velocity v sub h, remember velocity is length per time. So over time dt, they will actually cover length dv times, sorry, v velocity times the dt. So I will see then these holes moving here by dl, which is v dt. All right? How many holes are moving there? You see that I'm forming a sort of a quadrilateral that is a small volume is being formed out of this motion of the holes through this cross section. And the volume of this can be actually calculated from this ds and dl. So we know that the volume of the quadrilateral here can be found as ds 
dot product DL. You have uh, uh, seen the, or you may remember from school, the formula is base uh, times height. So this dot product takes, takes care of the height because it projects DL on DS. So that is, uh, in fact, you can test it yourself that this formula indeed with the dot product gives you the volume. So then I have, in fact, I apply here this uh, calculation to find how many holes do I have. I have, or how many charges do I have in this motion. I have NH E times this volume, uh, which is ds dot dl. Let me write dl first. Yes. Okay. That means that the rate of change of charge is equal to nh e vh and VH is mobility times electric field, and that is where now I bring into this definition the electric field. So I will actually use a different color to emphasize this. So this is the mobility. So these quantities are specific to the material. How many holes I have per unit volume, what's their mobility? And now I have the electric field here, and that I take the dot product with ds. So this is actually the current due to the holes through this ds. Similarly, and I won't repeat the calculation, you can find that the corresponding charge that we have due to the electron motion, and that gives you, as I argued before, a current that actually you need to add up to this current, is equal to Ne times E mu E, E dot ds. So I have to add up these two currents and uh, find the total current that flows through this uh, a differentially small area ds. So I will do that now. Uh, probably I need to use my eraser. Just to try again. Okay, so the total current then and uh, just putting everything together will be <coughs> times the electric field dot ds. So two things. What I have here is actually a quantity that depends on the material only. And of course the uh, charges, the electron charge appears there as well. But NH, mu H, NE, mu E depends solely on the material. This is defined as a conductivity of the material. So a quantity that you have seen probably before, conductivity of a material is defined on a fundamental basis as this quantity. So this is conductivity Uh, you can uh, extract the units of conductivity if uh, you recall this is amps and uh, this is volts per meter times uh, meter squared. So this will be amps per volts meter. And uh, we assign to this uh, amps per volt the unit of Siemens S. Siemens is amps per volt. Uh, and uh, you also remember that there is also the ohms, which is volts per amps.
and that is 1 over Siemens. So as we will see, uh, this is uh, conductivity is uh, 1 over resistivity, conductance 1 over resistance. And if you notice what we are really discussing here is the fundamentals of circuit equations and circuit analysis. Last time we had uh, the opportunity to uh, discuss the that the, the Kirchhoff voltage law is basically E dot dl equals zero. It is the second fundamental equation for the electrostatic field. So here we will see uh, the foundation of Ohm's law, uh, as well as uh, the power dissipation laws that you are using in, uh, in uh, electric circuits. So this is uh, the conductivity. And then if I want to calculate the total current that flows through the cross section, the total current that flows through the cross-section, let's say I have here uh, a slab like this, and this is the cross-section, the entire cross-section S of the wire, or let me call it, uh, well, I have to call it S, it's different than the Siemens, but I will clarify. Then what do I need to do? I have uh, to integrate this quantity over the entire cross section. And I will uh, give you an example in a little bit, but before I do the example, I wanted to also introduce this quantity here, sigma E, as the volume current density J. In fact, your textbook uh, discusses this at the outset of the chapter. So this is equal to sigma times electric field. The units for this are amps per meter squared. So you see, you integrate this over a cross section and you get amps, you get current. And you may ask, why do I have here a volume current density that is given in amps per meter squared? And that is something that you can see from the fundamental definition of this. So the current is defined as flux of electrons through a cross-section. So this flux happens over a volume, as you see right here. So obviously, this is a volumetric flow, okay? but the current actually is defined as the flux of those electrons through a cross-section. And as you remember, or as you may have seen and noticed, if you add an extension cord to a cable, you don't increase the current. Okay? You cannot burn your laptop by extending the cord uh, with an extension cable. You cannot drive the current to one million amps by adding extension cords. This is because the longitudinal dimension of this does not increase the current. The current is really defined, as you see here, if you follow, go back to uh, your notes after the lecture, uh, if you haven't uh, um, fully understood it so far, that this is actually defined as the flow of the electrons. You count the electrons as they flow through the cross-section. So uh, that's why we have here a current density that is volume current density, meaning that the flow happens over the volume of a material, but then the uh, uh, units are amps per meter squared. Okay. So this, in fact, is Ohm's law. So this is Ohm's law. Or the field form of Ohm's law. You see it relates a current-related quantity on the left with the voltage-related quantity on the right through a linear relation, just like V equals uh, Ri or I equals uh, V over R. So let me give you an example, or before I give you the example, let me just uh, 
again go back to the quantitative aspect of this and uh, show you some conductivities, typical conductivities for materials. And at some point the projector will come on and uh, uh, I hope and uh, it will project a table of uh, conductivities. Okay, there we go. So in uh, good conductors like silver, copper and so on, uh, the conductivity is humongous. So we're talking about uh, conductivities in the millions, 6.2 times 10 to the 7th uh, Siemens per meter, 5.8 times 10 to the 7. Uh, so these are the good conductors. Conductivities are in the millions of Siemens per meter. For semiconductors, you see that the conductivity goes down. For germanium, which I invoked in my example, 2.2 Siemens per meter. So you have this situation where some uh, charges are bound, some charges are free. And then you have the insulators where the conductivity like glass, paraffin, fused quartz, where the conductivity is actually uh, almost uh, zero. And that's why we have these opposing ends and those uh, two ends, the perfect conductors and the perfect insulators, are, uh, perfect dielectrics, are actually very useful because sometimes we will say, I don't care if the conductivity is uh, 10 billions, I will just take the limit of conductivity going to infinity and I will work with that. Or likewise, with the perfect dielectrics, I don't care if the conductivity is 10 to minus 17, I will just consider it zero and we'll proceed with my study. So we will do, we study these opposing ends, although for you as engineers it may seem counterintuitive if someone comes and tells you conductivity is infinite or conductivity is zero, because there's no zero in infinity here. However, practically, indeed, for some materials it tends to infinity or it is large enough so that we can practically consider it infinity and likewise it can be small enough so that we can consider it equal to zero. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the table that makes things, uh, gives you a numerical sense of, uh, or quantitative sense of what we're talking about here. And uh, now going back to why this is Ohm's law. And since we have the current, I will give you uh, two examples, uh, hopefully two. Let's see. So the first example is indeed the capacitor. So the parallel plate capacitor. So I will use the form of the electric field that I proved with Laplace equation. Uh, if you remember my, in my example of the Laplace equation, uh, we had those two plates, z equal 0, z equal h, and we showed that if there is a potential difference between the plates equal to v0, the electric field can be expressed, this being the z-axis, the electric field can be expressed as minus z hat v0 over h. So volt uh, volts per meter obviously here. Now if I uh, have a conducting material with conductivity sigma in between, so instead of uh, now a total vacuum I have uh, a material with conductivity sigma, that electric field will actually cause a current, a current that will be uh, also defined downwards along the electric field. And I should actually uh, uh, make a note here because I, I was recently checking high school books. Uh, so when in, in high school uh, they uh, talk to you or they introduce electric circuits for the first time, they tell you that um, if I have, uh, let's say, a voltage source like this, the electrons flow like this. I don't know if uh, you remember it. Okay. And that is correct because uh, the, uh, the electrons are leaving the negative uh, pole of the battery and they go to the positive pole of the battery. That, that makes a lot of sense. 
But when you come to university or later on if you uh, learn something about circuits, when you draw the circuit diagram, in fact, the circuits professor tells you that you will have to go like this. And then this appears to be a contradiction, but it is uh, precisely because this diagram or the diagrams that you will see in circuit books, and, and, and then someone tells you maybe in high school as well, later in high school, I think this is uh, the first time that, uh, that is introduced and later they tell you, you draw the arrow against the, uh, the flow of the electrons. So now, if you uh, check university level books, always the flow of the electrons will be from the positive, or the, sorry, the, this arrow will be pointing from the positive to the negative. Is that, uh, does anybody have an opposite uh, impression? Am I saying something wrong here? I think that's what I checked from your uh, reading resources. Uh, and this is because this arrow points in the direction of J points in the direction of the electric field. So the electric field points from the positive to the negative, and hence J is defined as sigma E, positive to negative, and therefore it does not show you where the electrons go. J is defined as the quantity that relates the conductivity in the material with the electric field. So that is the fundamental origin of this arrow, and why people would come in and say, you know, I draw the arrow like this, that's what I want to do, and it will happen to be against the motion of the electrons, whereas if you are in grade 8 or grade 9 and they uh, tell you these are some circuits, put the arrow in, they will ask you to put the arrow in the direction that the electrons flow. So that is uh, really uh, the fundamental origin or what this arrow means in circuit theory. So this is uh, high school, uh, this is a university maybe, or perhaps earlier than university, but uh, the point is that this arrow is uh, pointing in uh, volume current density J. So in this now conductor, we will have J equals sigma E, which means that the uh, current density will also be pointing in the minus Z direction. And if I want to calculate the total current, let me turn this capacitor around so that it reminds you more of a resistor. Yes, please. Shouldn't the current density also be in the direction of the electron flow? No, uh, no. And uh, you can, uh, now I have erased my calculation, but you can see that the current density is defined, the way it is defined is defined to the right, because dQ has to be positive. And uh, in fact, I didn't uh, do this in detail, but uh, the, uh, the short answer to your question is that charges going to the left, or electrons going to the left, also makes the right part of the conductor more positive. So the right part, if you look at this cross-section, you are getting through the cross-section positive charge for two reasons. Because the holes are coming through, and because the electrons are leaving, because the electrons leaving also make this uh, right part more positive. You see? So at the end of the day, the way that we define this current density is uh, in the direction of the electric field, and that's why when you check uh, tables of conductivities, they will always give you positive values. So copper, for example, where everything is uh, electrons. In copper, there is no holes moving. or, or every, uh, All the charged particles are electrons. Uh, still, the conductivity is 5.8 times 10 to the 7 Siemens per meter. It's not minus 5.8. Right? Uh, so this is uh, the current density. So how much is the current? Let me turn this uh, capacitor around. So put the plates like this. So that it reminds you more of a resistor because that is uh, the function that we are seeing right now. It's the function of, a, of uh, this uh, parallel plate system as a resistor. So let's assign area A to this capacitor. Okay. The electric, uh, so this is uh, still the positive and the negative. The electric field is in this direction. 
always the electric field, you see how all the concepts we've seen tie together. The electric field points the direction of decreasing potential. You see from the positive to the negative. Or the electric field points from the positive charges to the negative charges. Again, you can uh, see both concepts we've seen before manifesting themselves in, in this diagram. And uh, therefore, I have this current flow through the cross section. So the total current is basically uh, minus z hat sigma v naught over h, which is the current density. That ds, you see the z-axis is pointing in this direction, so ds points in the direction of the minus z-axis. And if you go to aid sheet, uh, differential surface elements for Cartesian coordinates, you will see that the z-hat differential surface element is dx dy. So this is what I put there. So minus that minus gives me plus one. These are constants. Sigma v naught over h, integral of dx dy over the cross section of the capacitor will give me the area of the capacitor. So this is sigma, and sorry, I shouldn't be having a bar there, the vector. It's, the current is a scalar quantity. Too many vectors here, but this shouldn't be a vector. A. Okay. So you can also see this uh, equation. You can invert it and see it as V naught over I V naught over I as being H the separation between the two plates divided by conductivity times area, which is the resistance of this parallel plate system, which you can see as a capacitor, but if you stick in a conducting material in between, it acts also as a resistor. So that's why I'm saying that this J equals sigma E eventually gives you Ohm's law. And uh, you can use this to derive resistances in general systems. Uh, so the definition of the resistance, so just to go from the specific example to a more general definition, So for a material of length L cross section V, you know resistance is voltage per current, but now, uh, now we can uh, define it a little bit more systematically. So let's say this is the positive terminal, this is the negative terminal, and uh, there is an electric field like this from the positive to the negative terminal, and along with the electric field, there is a current density, J. Which is sigma E. J, that is sigma E. So the resistance formally is defined as the voltage from the positive to the negative terminal, which is E dot DL, divided by the current through the cross section S, which is sigma E dot DS. 
So this is precisely the type of calculation we did here. And uh, in fact, as we saw in this case, as we saw in this case, the current was proportional to the voltage. So when we reached the point where we took the ratio V over I, we ended up with length or separation between the plates divided by sigma A. And these quantities here, H sigma A, are all independent of voltage and depend only on the geometry and the material. Sigma defines the material, A the cross-section, L the length. And that's why resistance is a thing. Because it, you take a piece of uh, a wire and you say this is the resistance. It does not depend on the voltage uh, that I apply or uh, some other external factor. It solely depends on the geometry. So because the electric field appears in the numerator and the denominator, eventually the electric field terms cancel out and you have something that depends only on the geometry and uh, the material of uh, the wire that uh, you consider. Material through sigma and the geometry. Uh, through S, uh, area, and length. So you see this is the formal, uh, the formal definition of the formula you have seen before, that the, resistor, the resistance is length divided by conductivity times uh, cross-section. Uh, any questions? Questions? Uh, sigma, no, the conductivity. So I mean that here, if you look at this formula, you see the material, the, the sigma, the conductivity. So all, all these properties are dependent on the material and not, let's say, the voltage source you are bringing in uh, to create this effect. Okay. All right. Uh, let's now... You know that when you have current through a wire, the wire heats up. Why? Because there is power dissipated uh, and that power is converted to heat. How much is that? One can uh, find it again from, for, from first principles. So this dissipated or ohmic power can be found as follows. If you look at uh, the motion here, let's say, of one uh, hole or any positive particle this way, dq, the electric field is actually doing some work to push this particle along a length dl here. The work that is done to move this over DL is actually from mechanics F dot DL and F here is nothing else but DQ times the electric field dot DL. Okay. Uh, so then if I uh, want to find the rate of change of this, which is the power that is being dissipated in this motion, that will be dq over dt e dot dl. So I do something that mathematicians would uh, think of as outrageous, so I'm dividing both hand sides with dt and I 
interpret this as uh, as uh, derivative. And here I have the current that is being formed through this motion, which is, as I found before, J dot ds, where ds is this elementary cross section through which this particle flows. And all this has to be uh, multiplied by E dot dl. Now I rearrange the terms here and I find this. And this is the volume dv, that volume over which uh, this elementary flow happens over time dl, the little volume that I used before to count charges. And finally, I find that the volume density of power dissipated of ohmic power dissipated so that is I have a bulk of a material there is power dissipated of so and so watts now I'm finding the volume density like, like every little point in the material how much does it contribute to this power that will be E dot J. Or if you replace J from Ohm's law, sigma E squared. So I'll stop here. This is uh, Joule's law. And I will use that uh, tomorrow in a final exam, E squared, sorry. Uh, and I will use that in a, an example to show you how to calculate power and resistance using these two. So we saw these two circuit laws uh, derived from first principles today. Thanks for your attention. I'll stick around for questions and otherwise we'll see you tomorrow.